Hey, did you know? America can't do anything right with Japanese properties. Unlike glorious Nippon, which is so much better at handling filthy American properties. Okay, but really though, as much bullshit as there is to this mentality, I think it's easy to see that America hasn't had the best track record when it comes to live-action movies based on anime and manga franchises. You could argue that there aren't enough of them, and they don't come out often enough to make a proper judgment on that, but most people you ask will agree that none of them are good. In any case, there's one movie released not too long ago that I personally feel very differently about. It may fall into many of the same pitfalls as the other movies in this category, but at the same time I don't feel like it deserves to be lumped up with all of them. When discussing the 2017 Death Note movie, you'll often hear remarks such as, I can't believe Netflix did this and I dread to think of what Netflix will do to other animes! I think people who say this don't know the full history of this movie's development. In 2008, Vertigo Entertainment revealed that they were developing a new Death Note movie to be written by Vlas and Charles Parlapanides. A year later, Warner Brothers acquires the rights to it. In 2011, Shane Black is hired as the director for the movie, Anthony Bagarozzi and Charles Mondry now writing the screenplay. We'd hear nothing about the movie until 2013 when Shane says that he's still connected to the movie's development. 2014, it's reported that Gus Van Sant is replacing Shane Black as the director. 2015, suddenly Adam Winger is directing the movie and Jeremy Slater is writing it alongside Vlas and Charles from before. In 2016, Netflix has now acquired the movie. Finally, production and filming for the movie actually begins and it's slated for a 2017 release. Yes, the movie was planned in 2008, had all these changes to the production team, and came out nine years later. Adaptation or not, Japanese or not, American or not, Netflix or not. This movie was doomed from the start. I can only think of so many projects with a crazy history of changing hands like this that actually turned out decent. Funny thing I remember is how Zac Efron of High School Musical fame was considered to take the role of Light at one point. Honestly, I still kind of wish that had happened instead of whoever the heck this guy is with the weirdly shaped nose. But you know what? That only makes this movie more exciting. After so many years of this movie being a pipe dream, it somehow got finished. Lord knows what kind of catastrophic mess would come out of such a troubled production, so I want to dive right into it. First though, I should talk a little bit about the anime it's based on. Death Note was one of my first gateway enemies that got me into anime in general. Looking back, it's not super memorable or amazing, but it's still really well written and holds up today. I remember it fondly and I appreciate what it's done for me and for others. Helps that Madhouse did an excellent job of the adaptation. Besides removing the line where Ryuk wants to play Mario Golf, they made almost no changes from the manga. On the opposite side of the fence, this movie clearly does its own thing, and I'm honestly thankful for that. It doesn't try to bring back the Death Note we all know and love, but rather, it tries to make something fresh and new with the concept. Does that shield it from criticism? No, of course not! But let's look at this movie for what it is and see how it delivers. By the way, the movie contains Happy Gore, just so you know. Hey guys, where do you think this movie takes place? A high school, maybe? I think it takes place in a manufacturing warehouse, but that's just me. Ugly Nose Man here is doing other people's homework for money, when suddenly it starts raining along with a death note dropping down conveniently right next to Light. Light runs into a bully who's intervened by a girl who Light tries to defend. Uh, no, I think it's very sad actually. I only mention it because that would make you over 18, which means that if you were to beat me up, which I'm sure you could, it would technically be child abuse. So if you don't want to wind up on some kind of registry, I suggest you back the fuck! I'm looking at homework here for at least 15 different students. Are we really not going to discuss the fact that I have an ice pack on my face? Yep, Light gets busted for the homework scheme and the bully gets off scot-free. Some people might look at you, a kid in your situation, losing your mom the way you did, and they'd be willing to cut you a little slack when it comes to these kind of behavioral issues. Light goes to detention for saying Merry Christmas and the teacher walks out and blindly trusts Light not to make a scene. Yeah, that's what high school delinquents are good at doing, not making a scene when they're left alone without a teacher. Instead though, he just looks at his sky death note to see what it's all about while he's interrupted by some marbles. Light sees Ryuk, who for some reason is fucking up the entire classroom just by existing, and Light justifiably freaks out. Everybody seems to hate this scene because he's way more dramatic than he was in the anime, but come on, are you really gonna sit here and tell me you would react so calmly to seeing a big ass monster in your school? Light, while smart, is not the same mega genius he is in the original. He's meant to be a lot more normal and relatable in this movie. Light sees that the same bully from earlier is harassing a girl, so Ryuk, given an excellent performance by Willem Dafoe of Spider-Man fame, tempts him to kill the guy, even telling him to brainstorm on how to kill. Oh, and Light doesn't have a pen for some reason, even though he was just doing other people's homework and is currently in detention? And now we see the first death in this movie. I love that we see reality manipulated by the Death Note in slow motion, creating a butterfly effect of events that lead to this metal ladder blowing a man's head off. 
Next scene is in Light's extraordinarily flimsy house where he and his dad, who's still a cop, discuss the bully's death. Kidney action. Oh no, I don't think he was a friend of anyone. In case the exposition about Light's mom dying from the principal wasn't enough, we get this big ass argument between the two of them. You're a cop. How do you sleep at night knowing you just watched while mom got like Andy Skoma walked away? Well, what you think I just watched? If I was a cop and some guy ran over my wife, I'd be pretty pissed off if his dad paid his way out of jail. He killed my mom, he nearly beat his girlfriend to death, and you just sit there, you just sit there saying the same bullshit about what? how people better just I'm gonna trust assume your age. You're still pretty raw your... by what you saw today at school, and that's keeping you from thinking before you speak. I suggest you stop talking. Gotta give credit where it's due though. Shea Wiggum is a pretty good actor. Light storms upstairs, by the way, subscribe to Storm Dane, and begins reading all the Death Note rules. I gotta say, this movie really does do a good job of showing them in a new, familiar, but not completely ripped off way. Don't trust Ryuk. He's not your pet, he's not your friend. Hey kid. Ah! It's pronounced Ryuk. Okay, someone working on this movie knew what they were doing. Man, Willem Dafoe's Ryuk is just incredible in this movie, and I can't overstate that. Ryuk was great in the original because he just doesn't give a fuck. He was along for the ride just like everyone else watching. He didn't care who was right and who was wrong, he just wanted to enjoy a thrilling show. The series juggled themes of moral justification of the death penalty, the line between man and god, and just plain classic supernatural murder mystery. Meanwhile, this entire movie focuses a lot more on the murder mystery thriller aspect rather than the philosophical and symbolical direction of the original. When watching this movie, it's a good thing to accept that early on so that you can see it for what it is and critique it more fairly. Now that Light knows the power he holds, he uses it to avenge his mother by having a waiter trip on a salt shaker and accidentally stab him. That's pretty darn silly, but I'll take it. Next morning, Light and his dad are getting along again now that the killer is dead. I just got a call. Our friend Anthony Skolman is no more. Impaled himself on a steak knife in the middle of a restaurant. Oh shit. Yeah. At school, the girl from yesterday meets Light in the gym and introduces herself as Mia. No, not Misa, Mia. Also, yes, while I'm on the subject, Aya Hirano is the single best thing about the original, and yes, it's a shame she's not in this, but what are you gonna do? I'm Mia. Oh, hi. I know that you're Mia, actually, already. I already knew that. I know that you're Light Turner. His name is Light Turner?! <laughs> oh my god, I can't get over that! Light Turner! Light Turner! Turner! Oh my god! Anyway, Mia here is a little curious about the Death Note, and despite only knowing this woman for a day, he trusts her with the forbidden knowledge of this super weapon. What are you talking about? Only the keeper of the note can see me. Kind of a weird change from the original, but I guess it doesn't really mean much in the long run. Read the last entry. Can you doyle decapitation? This is the face you make when you confess to a murder. For some reason, Light really wants Mia to know about the Death Note, so he looks up a live crime scene and kills a guy holding his wife hostage. Compared to the first two kills, this one's really underwhelming, which is disappointing because I wanted them to go balls to the walls with every death, but nope. Oh, and thankfully, Mia's not only just okay with everything Light's doing, but she supports him. Good thing she just coincidentally shares the exact same beliefs of justice, or else he'd be in hot water right now. Also, they start making out. Honestly, though, the romance in the original was kind of shoehorned in, so I can't complain too much. Hell, as we go through this movie, I'll go into detail as to how I think the romance adds more to the story here than it did in the original. Next death is this Korean war criminal blowing his head off while Light and Mia are talking about how much they want to do good for the world. For some strange reason, Light actually wants people to call him Kira because it's a red herring in this, I guess. Oh, and guess what? This train wreck? That's news footage from a real train crash in Belgium from 2010. 19 people died for this movie, all because they didn't want to go to the effort of putting literally anything else in there. We then go to the crime scene of a dozen Yakuza having killed each other in a nightclub. This is where they introduce L, who is black for some reason. Well, it's better than the whitewashing, I guess. Help somewhat that Watari here is played by a Japanese man. L also reveals that he baited Kira into killing all these people. Seems like overkill if you ask me, but it worked. Later on at the police station, Watari approaches Light's dad to help with the Kira investigation. L reveals that he knows Kira is in Seattle. This is the first time we see L doing the L things. Sitting awkwardly, eating snacks, mimicking the speech patterns. It's all here! Light and Mia look at a website of people asking Kira to kill random ass people they have grudges against. Why do we know that it's real? 
What do you mean? I mean, like, what if somebody fucked your girlfriend and you put him on the list because you just want to kill him? What would you do if some guy fucked me? Oh, I'd kill him. Yeah? Yeah. And you'd kill him? Yeah. You'd kill him? Okay, yeah, but that, but that is the exact reason why we can't kill people based on website rumors. I, uh, I don't know what to say here. Lightstat is invited to L's base of operations. L reveals that he's deducted Light's first recorded murder. This is Zero Day, Kita's first recorded murders, but previously, on April 15th, convicted felon James W. Brody had taken his wife and children hostage. The standoff had never made national news, and it was only broadcast on local Seattle stations. Wait, it was only on Seattle News? But it was online! Does that mean anyone in the country, or hell, even the world, if they're using a VPN, could see it? Here, I'll rewrite this for you. Light invites Mia to his house to watch the news on television, and then they kill the guy. See? Just fixed it. Anyway, now Elle's provoking Kira on TV, proving his theory about the name and face being required. Prior to his death, all of the victims have had their identities released to the media. This would suggest that Kita is not some omnipotent force. He's a person, like you or me. Kita, if you're watching this, know that I am coming for you. Unless, of course, you'd like to kill me right now. Kita cannot kill by simply sight alone. He needs a name and a face. In order to cover his ass, Light congratulates his dad on pursuing Kira. Besides, I think you can tell when you're sitting across from a killer like Kira. Haha, <laughs> funny. Light can tell that he's being followed, to which the dad catches on and confronts Elle about. You put someone on my kid? We agreed that everyone with access needed to be thoroughly vetted. I did not see it prudent to have you investigate yourself. It's such a short scene, but this, again, is L being L. He leaves no stone unturned and examines all the evidence closely to catch the suspect. Light and Mia then ride on a ferris wheel to have a private conversation. Anybody who's seen the trailer knows what this is foreshadowing. Mia wants to kill the police, but Light doesn't. A far cry from the original where Light was willing to take on law enforcement to administer his power. This is how we're introduced to an interesting dynamic that this movie offers to set itself apart from the source material. Unlike the anime's Light who became ruthless and lacked any conscience or second thoughts once he got a hold of the note, this Light is a lot more merciful and is willing to spare those who pursue him. It's Mia who's willing to go all out and kill all those who support Kira. Wah, wah, wah. Meanwhile, the actual Misa was just a pawn used by Light. She was a clever way of giving Light Shinigami eyes without actually giving him Shinigami eyes. I'm not dissing on Misa, and I don't think she's a bad character, and once again, Aya Hirano is the best part of the original. But Mia here offers a more interesting dynamic with Light. Instead of being an ally, she's a foil to him. Stay tuned to see the crazy shit that it leads up to with the climax of this movie. The next day, a bunch of policemen are killing themselves, and Light thinks Ryuk was the one who did it. I asked politely that you didn't hear me. Let the note go. Look at the strife it's causing you and your little girlfriend. Let me find it a new home. We'll be free of each other. I love that even Ryuk knows that Light isn't as smart or cruel as he is in the anime. There are four letters in my name. Most anyone's ever gotten were two. Okay, then who wrote this? Light's dad is on TV, taunting Kira. And this is where Light draws a line and doesn't want Mia killing any more police. Hey, you know how in the original, L knew Light was Kira from the start, but all he ever did was try to manipulate him into exposing himself with no way out? Well, in this movie... Light Turner is Kira. No room for subtlety here. No, really, I'm not criticizing the movie. I genuinely like that they don't even try to hide it. We got Light reading concept art for the manga in this bar when suddenly he's joined by L. I wonder if it was a difficult decision. If w what was a difficult decision? Sparing your father's life. Do so you really think that I'm Kira? No, I know it. Well, if you're so sure, then why have you just arrested me? Oh, because I don't do check lines. Only check me. I do really like the conversation they have here, but, uh... What if it turned out that all arresting Kira did was give that power to someone else? Someone potentially much worse. Light basically confesses in Elle's face. And there are 45 minutes left in this movie. Light runs back to his home and has a run-in with Mia. Please, Light. You have to forgive me. my dad, Mia. If I could take it back, I would. I promise. I was just... I was scared, okay? You think I'm not scared? I love you. Aww. Atari becomes obsessed with revealing the true identity of the detective known as L. Wait up! What is this guy's actual name? And writing in the death note actually somehow fucking works? Hello? My name is Watari. This information is not known to me. What? Why does this actually work? Why does Watari have only one word in his name? 
Why did he not use a pseudonym when L knew that all Kira needed was a name and a face? Yeah, this is the stupidest thing about this movie. Wachari's name actually working with the Death Note. Yes, before anyone points it out, I know that L's real name, canonically, is L. Lolliet. But one, that works as a red herring because L isn't normally a person's name, and two, his last name was still a secret so nobody could have used it against him. Here, Wachari makes no effort to hide his name or face despite being L's right-hand man. Anyway, L notices Wachari's disappearance and goes straight to Light's home. This is another thing I don't like about the movie. After L's personality, habits, and mannerisms were all really well captured, he suddenly loses and becomes all aggressive as soon as Wachari's missing. Police start raiding the house and Ryuk's taunting. You know what happens when they find it. It ends up my book again, Light. And guess what name I'm gonna suggest we start with when I find it a new home. I don't know, can you really write Light Turner in there without dying of laughter? When Light comes to school the next day, Mia reveals she took the note in the nick of time while also preparing for homecoming. Meanwhile, Watari is searching for L's name and for whatever reason, Ryuk's here. Yep, Death Note has Light and his girlfriend at a high school dance making funny faces with the camera. Honestly though, compared to Matsuda doing drunken aerobatics to fake his own death, it's not that strange. Also, I guess passing the silly hat on to someone else actually somehow works in creating a distraction for the police. Light uses this opportunity to take the note and call Watari about L's name. Except the page with Wachari's name is now missing, so right as he finds the name, some random asshole guns him down. I don't know who this guy is, I don't know what his motive for killing Wachari is, besides the Death Note manipulating reality and all, but... He does it. Light goes back to take his hat and dance with Mia, where Mia reveals that she took the page to save Light. Plus she killed those policemen, which I guess somehow Light hasn't figured out yet. Yep, there it is again. Light and Mia have this conflict of interests. Light's the one with a conscience, while Mia's the one who's willing to take anyone out for the common goal that they share. Oh, but here's the kicker! Mia wrote Light's name in the book too, so she could blackmail him into giving her the book! Man, say what you want to say about their romance being shoehorned even more than the original, but this is way more interesting than anything Light and Misa did to each other before. L learns the news about Watari's death and immediately goes after Light. Light's got the note and police dad's calling his buddy cops to go after L. Before making a run for it, L gets on the Kira subreddit and starts writing names down. Mia gets a text from Light inviting her to the faded Ferris wheel. Light's on the run from both L and the Popo, leading us to a really cool chase scene. Eventually L catches him at gunpoint until a civilian gets involved. Do not move! This man is Kira. I'm working with law enforcement in order to capture and eliminate- <laughs> Okay, that's both really funny and a really clever way of using a Kira worshipper like that. Now Light's got the gun and takes Mia up to the top of the Ferris wheel. We gotta stop doing this. We gotta, gotta stop doing all this. It's already done! Let's just run away together and never use the Death Note again. If you love me, then you gotta trust me. Don't take the book. Because if you do, you'll never see me again. No! Oh boy. What did he do? Oh boy. He put my name in it. <laughs> As the trailer foretold, the Ferris wheel starts to collapse and Light and Mia are hanging on for dear life. Mia loses her grip and falls to her death in a bed of roses. Honestly, I kind of wish that's how she had died in the original. If anything, I think it would have been more fitting for the actual Misa. Oh, and you can't pass out the opportunity for some good old-fashioned Jesus symbolism here. 48 hours later, apparently Kira is still killing despite Light like, being comatose. A man brings the note to his hospital bed while Elle's about to catch a plane somewhere. Light's paid a visit by his dad, who's finally figured out that his son was Kira and that his first kill was the guy who killed his mom. I mean, it was actually the bully, but whatever. Now we learn the big plan Light hatched at the very end. He wrote two criminals' names in the book. One to save Light from certain death, and one more to take the note, kill criminals, and bring it back to him. Plus, along with Mia's name, he included a clause where the page containing his name gets burned. Meanwhile, Elle's at Light's place and finds the death note page with the names of all the policemen who were killed by Mia, tempting L to take revenge against Light. Ryuk is laughing at the soon-to-be-killed Light and we cut to credits. Well, that's the 2017 Death Note movie. After nine years in development, I honestly... Wait a sec, Nate Wolf? Why does that name ring a bell? He's that fucking guy from Naked Brothers Band? My god, they weren't able to get Zac Efron, but they still managed to land in the same ballpark. Or at least the ballpark next door. 
So anyway, now that I'm done with that incredible revelation, it should be known that this movie obviously isn't perfect as a surprise to nobody. But man, it's way more fun than it had any right to be. The story is fucking stupid, you can tell just by watching the movie that after changing hands in production so many times, they had no fucking clue what they were doing anymore. But when this movie gets something right, it gets it fucking right. You really need to know what to expect from this movie and be accepting of all the dumb shit that goes on, but it's an absolute blast. This movie obviously isn't the first good Hollywood adaptation of a Japanese franchise, but it's a step in the right direction. In many ways, it really does recapture what made the world fall in love with Death Note to begin with, but still sticks out from the crowd and does cool things you wouldn't expect. Obviously, not everyone's gonna see the movie the way I see it, even if you're not in the Ken-sama camp, but knowing how crazy this movie's production is and seeing it as nothing more than a joke for many years, I'm nothing short of impressed by how the movie ultimately turned out. Hell, despite the fans hating this movie so much, manga co-creators Sugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata have gone on record to say that they liked it a lot. They have an appreciation for how American filmmakers had a different take on Death Note, and sought to create a different vision of the same idea. I think we can all learn something from that. Adaptations can be drastically different from what they're based on and still work. Hell, I'd go as far as to say that making something completely different can work better than aiming for a one-to-one -one recreation. When you try to be as precise as possible, differences and changes will inevitably slip through the cracks, making them all the more glaring and distracting from what's been accomplished. When you do something brand new, you have way more creative freedom, and while not all of it worked, I have to commend them for doing it. Adam Wingard seems to have a sequel planned. Honestly, I have no fucking clue how to continue the plot from where it was left off. It seems kinda conclusive as is. Whatever they do end up making, I hope it can somehow be another fun romp like this one. Just without the stupid plot holes, please. Ideally, I'd like the next movie to be just as fun as this one, but also genuinely well written. Death Note 2017 is a movie that should be watched, but with caution. Be prepared to hate it, especially if you're a diehard fan of the source material. But if you go in with the same mindset as Ryuk, just wanting to enjoy the ride, it'll be easy to see that adaptations really are interesting.